Zach Streif, the play-by-play -play announcer for the Saints radio network. And I'll start with this one, Zach. Uh, tell me, like, the, those waning moments of last week's game. Do you still get nervous as a former player who played for the Saints, won a championship with the Saints? Do you still get a little nervous as you're up there make, uh, commenting on the game? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, for, first of all, thanks for having me, Kirk. Sorry. No, you can um, say. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I think, you know, I have such close personal relationships with so many guys on the field that, uh, you know, you want to see them win. You want to see them succeed. Um, and certainly I still feel invested in this team. Uh, you know, I got to play with the saints for 12 years. And so, um, I'm just a few months removed. So I still feel like I'm a part of it. And, uh, I certainly, uh, get a little amped up in, in some of those moments. But you still got, look, you're still, to me, you, you can still play. I've seen you, you look like you can still play, but how did this opportunity really come about? Because, we know how difficult it is just to be an analyst. I'm an analyst. But when you do the play-by-play -play role, that's totally different. Were you practicing for this role? Were you doing things outside of football? Or is this was something that you always wanted to do was be the play-by-play -play guy? Well, I, I almost wish that I had a better story here. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I retired in March uh, after 12 years. It was something that I kind of knew going into the season that I was going to be finished. And um, really what happened was I was taking a bunch of interviews with local media uh, just to see what was available, kind of one of those deals where it's just, you know, let's see everything that, that really exists out there and try to figure out if there's something I would like to do. I wasn't real interested in being an analyst. Um, so I met with a, a local radio station, WWL, which is uh, the, the home station for the Saints Radio Network, and uh, we sat down, we talked for a while, they kind of brought up a bunch of other stuff, and, and sort of walking out the door, they were like, you know, so much of this business is availability and what's available and what's open. And, you know, we really don't have anything open right now, but we'd love to have you involved. You know, the only thing we're really searching for is play-by-play because -play, Jim had retired in, in February. And they kind of told me, you know, but that's not like a player job. Right. And so I kind of shook my head and I, I left the office. And by the time I got to my car, um, I felt like that was the only thing that I had been – that I had talked to anybody about over those couple of weeks that I had – real interest in, and I think mostly because of what Jim's status was as a play-by-play -play guy, 32 years for the Saints, and really iconic. And I think I realized uh, what a big role the play-by-play the -play, uh, voice of a team really has with that organization. And seeing as I love the organization, I, I saw it as a way to still be involved in a, in a really special and unique way. <laughs> he's Zach Streif. He's the radio play-by-play -play announcer for the New Orleans Saints. And look, you, you step into big shoes, obviously, but doing a terrific job, by the way. But the way this season has kind of gone for the New Orleans Saints, after the way that it ended last year, Zach, not the way that they possibly probably wanted it to end in Minnesota on the play. I know Marcus Williams wishes he could have that one back. But how do you describe this season so far up until this point after the way that it ended a year ago? I think, and you know, I, I, it's funny, in those moments, uh, in those, those really awful kind of devastating moments like last Minnesota was, and I think, yeah, it's probably a bit of an understatement to say that Marcus <laughs> wish he had it back. It's a pretty rough deal, uh, certainly for him and for the entire team and the city. Um, but I had kind of tweeted out after that game, I got hammered for it at the time, but that, you know, moments like those build champions and, mm -hmm. and that those – really heartbreaking moments, not only in sports, but in your life, uh, give you an opportunity to respond in a unique way with a unique motivation that maybe you otherwise wouldn't have. And I think if you watch this Saints team closely throughout this year, that play kind of comes back into the fold quite often because if there's one thing that I would tell you that this team has excelled in this year, it's closing out games. Um, they have found ways week after week to close games out that maybe uh, going into a drive look, you know, a little dim. You look at the, the Eagles game this week, which I honestly don't even think is a great example because that defense essentially shut them down for three quarters. But you take a look back at the Steelers game, the Steelers offense moving the ball pretty much at will. The fourth quarter is, is uh, two, two fumble recoveries and a, and a turnover on downs. That happened all season long, and I think that comes from, um, you know, that growth that you have as a team when you go through – a situation like they did in Minnesota, and I think it served them uh, well. And, and really, I think it's the reason that they're sitting in the position they are. You know, Zach, one of the th things I which I uh, I saw this off season, I thought it was really cool, was uh, you and your appreciation for the quarterback of the Saints, Drew Brees. You both got there in 2006 together, 
and what you guys were able to do, a couple conference championships, appearances, a Super Bowl. But what have you seen from Drew Brees since the day you got to New Orleans and were drafted to where he's at now? What do people like myself who are not in the organization, what do we don't know about? I mean, what don't we know about Drew Brees and what, and what you see on a day-to-day? Well, first of all, I, I never imagined when that press conference started that my, my crying face. Yeah, the, uh, the, the so tear ducts opened up, Zach. That. That's, I, I didn't want to call yeah. you out, but those, <laughs> those, those tear ducts, they, they, uh, they opened up and you were uh, flowing, man. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes, I was. I'll tell you. <laughs> not, not exactly my proudest moment, but certainly a moment that I was glad to have the opportunity right. to do. And, um, you know, I think what it is is this. For offensive linemen, I think that your success kind of runs through other people and you build bonds with guys because I feel like you get invested in them and certainly nobody more so for an offensive lineman than their quarterback. And, you know, kind of a unique situation to be in not only one team for 12 years, but to have the same coach and the same quarterback. And so that investment, you know, for me at that point had had been going on for a long time and the thing about Drew Brees that makes him, I think, special and unique is that there's never a point and there was never a time in in my career that I didn't feel like he had my back. Um, you know, I wasn't a starter my whole career. I certainly wasn't a high draft pick. Um, you know, I was a backup for five seasons, and there would be games where, you know, I had to play. And, you know, my first start as a rookie was against Simeon Rice. <laughs> and if you're the quarterback – and you have a, a seventh round, you know, rookie offensive lineman that quite honestly doesn't have a ton of physical ability. Uh, you, and, and Simeon Rice is the guy you could imagine a little bit of trepidation, but there was no point in that week. I mean, it was 100%. I believe fully in Zach. He's going to do a great job. I'm not even going to worry about it. He's my guy. And he did that over and over and over again. Um, you know, something that fortunately has been forgotten. Drew Brees missed one start to injury in his career in New Orleans, and I gave up that hit. Mm. Um, I went through that feeling of the entire city being upset with you because you're the guy that got Drew hurt. And never at any point has there ever been any wavering of support from Drew. And I think that it it makes you feel uh, responsible for him. And, And I think that's the thing about him that's so special is he has a way of making the guys around him love him uh, without trying, you know, it's his, it's his actual personality. It's real. His image is not manufactured. It just is who he is. He's down to earth. He's humble. And, and on top of the fact of being, you know, one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, he's really one of the best people I've ever been around in my entire life. And it just makes guys want to play for him. He's the radio play-by-play announcer for the New Orleans Saints. He'll be on the call this weekend, Rams at Saints, alongside Deuce McAllister. Uh, But one of the things, too, Zach, is you also came into this team with Sean Payton when he became the head coach. And you've seen him grow, not only as a head coach. And then you had those years in which the the three straight, you know, non-winning seasons. Then last year was sort of the rebound. And then this year, a conference championship what have you seen from Sean Payton uh, in terms of the leadership role or just being able to right the ship and get this team to where it's at right now? You know, I think there's a couple things about Sean that he always had from day one. One is the ability to, to know the pulse of his team, to know where his guys are at, to know what buttons to push. He's a great motivator. He's creative with that stuff. He, guys believe it. You know, it's, it's his personality. You know, the whole money thing went – you know, all over the place where he brings in, you know, $225,000 in cash and says, you want this, go win three games. That's Sean. Like, that's not a, you know, there's some coaches that could do that. People be like, oh, I can't believe he did that. There's, there's no question that that's 100% Sean's idea, you know, in that moment. And so that part he's always had. But what I think he's evolved in is, and I think it's why the Saints have, have kind of got out of that hole of three straight seven and nine years is he's evolved very much in his understanding, I think, of how to win football games. You know, this is a team that had always relied on the passing game um, almost exclusively at times. At least it felt like that as an offensive lineman. Um, And all of a sudden, I think he realized, man, I've got a good line. I've got these two really dynamic backs. This is a running football team, whether you like it or not. They started building the defense. They started building a team that could win a different way. And I think early in his career, I don't know that he would have seen that. I think that's a maturation of him understanding fully his team and how to win each individual game in a unique way, um, you know, that fits the opponent. I think that's what's made Bill Belichick so successful is, you know, you don't know one game all of a sudden they, they, they 
throw the ball 65 times, and that's a plan going into a game. And uh, I think Sean has, has kind of learned that over time, and I think that's why the Saints are so successful in close games in the past two years is they, they find ways to win them based on, you know, where their advantages are. And uh, I think it takes a lot of growth and confidence as a coach to be willing to change that week to week. You know, Zach, yesterday I talked about the the walk in which the opposing team has to take when they get off the bus. They get off the bus, you got to walk all the way across the field to the opposing locker room. And just how big the, the Superdome is when you walk in there and you don't see anybody in the stands. But kind of help me out in terms of you played in that last conference championship game that was held there against the Minnesota Vikings. Can you describe the environment of not only that game, but what you expect to see on Sunday? Yeah, so the, actually before this season, they put a big banner up. There's a, a, a big walkway. The Superdome is across the street from the arena, and so there's this big walkway. And they put a big banner across it this year. I think it's very fitting. It says, welcome to your last few moments of silence. <laughs> um, and I think that that, that is, a, is a pretty true statement. I think when you, when you go into the Superdome, you know it's going to be loud. What most people don't realize is how, uh, how loud and how almost – of a, uh, how much of like almost a physical nature there is to the noise in the Superdome. You know, it's a contained environment. Um, you can feel sound waves when there's enough of them, which is a pretty unique feeling. And uh, I think there's so much energy. The city loves the Saints so much that in these big games, it is a, it's a unique experience. It's almost physical, uh, which is strange, you know, as a player to feel crowd noise. Um, and you, and you can in these games in the Superdome. I know the NFC championship in 2009, uh, you know, and, and I've talked to a bunch of guys about this last week. I, I think the only exception uh, that, that you'll ever see the Superdome louder was Steve Gleason's punt block in the Atlantic game and the Superdome reopening. It was probably the only moment that the Superdome was ever louder uh, than it was for the NFC Championship game. The difference was that was a single play in a single moment. The NFC Championship game was four and a half hours long. <laughs> and it was like that the entire time. So it's a tough place to play. There's been comments this week that they didn't have too much trouble with it. Uh, you know, the last time they came in, uh, I, I would expect them to this time. I know certainly Brett Favre talked a lot about how hard it was for them when they came in in 2009. A couple more for you before we let you go, Zach. Uh, is it harder to call a game in, in that noise as a play-by-play announcer when it's that loud? And obviously I know you're feeling your emotions as well. How do you kind of taper your emotions and, and talk about what's happening on the field without getting too overly excited? Well, that's certainly uh, I've learned uh, it's something that I, that I can struggle with at times. As a matter of fact, you guys play that call, and I, I've heard it a bunch this week, uh, Marshawn's interception, and I'm disappointed with it every time because I couldn't really get as excited as that moment warranted because I had already lost my voice. <laughs> so I was kind of struggling through. When it does get that loud, you feel that urge to, like, you know, to be louder. Right. And uh, as a matter of fact, earlier in the game, the touch, the 54 yard pass to Alvin Kamara for a touchdown from Taysom Hill, I thought was a great call, but it completely shot my vocal cords. And those are the types of things that as a young play by play uh, guy, I'm learning. Uh, and, and it's not, you know, certainly not by any stretch a, a perfect uh, call every week, but uh, yeah, that stuff can, that, that stuff can be difficult. I've, I've gotten advice from a lot of great uh broadcasters around the country that have been really helpful to me and uh number one is you know you gotta you gotta take a step back and 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 be a little more almost reserved in certain parts of those games otherwise you know it's all going to be high and it's all going to be uh it's it's almost too much excitement and certainly your voice is going to pay for that and so i'm learning still uh that was certainly i know for me every time i hear it this week i'm like ah it could have been so much better it was such a big play and i'm up there just worrying about my voice cracking Man, it sounds like you've been doing it for years, Zach, by the way. So don't even – I love the emotion, that. and that's the that's the calls that we get a chance to hear. But it, trust me, we will be listening this Sunday because this is the game that I think a lot of people want to see, Sean versus Sean. I think a, one last question, too. Everyone keeps talking about the quarterbacks and the coach and the offensive – or the head coaches – but what about the defensive coordinators, too? Dennis Allen, Wade Phillips, no one talks about those guys. There has to be some defense played in this game, right, Zach? Yeah, and, and I would not be surprised at all. I, 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 so many times in my career, those games that you're like, oh, this is going to be a shootout that right. turn into 14 to 12s all of a sudden, you know? And, and 
I think both these defenses, listen, the Saints defense has been sensational since week 10. Yeah. I mean, and, and really back to uh, around week seven, they've been phenomenal. They were phenomenal last week. I mean, the Philadelphia Eagles, for all of the offensive firepower they have offensively and as well as they were playing, had 99 yards of offense in the final three quarters of that game. They completely shut that team down, and they've done that to numerous teams. Um, and, and then you look at the Rams, who I think at times this year have struggled more than people would have thought, but all of a sudden in the biggest moment against Dallas last week, they were dominating. So yeah. I think these are two really good defenses. I think they're two underrated defenses. And in these big games, I just think – you know, in the Superdome, defense is going to reign supreme uh, more so than people might think. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But, yeah, I think two very talented groups and certainly, uh, you know, the unquestionable defensive player of the year coming in on that defensive line and Aaron Donald uh, will be a, a tall task for the Saints. So, Zach, bigger party if the Saints win on Sunday or last Sunday's <laughs> Drew Brees 40th birthday party at your, at your brewery? Yeah, I I, uh, I don't know that we're going to top that this week. To be honest with you, now the city will <laughs> collectively, um, but the the Drew Brees 40th. We the the joke of the night was I hope Drew Brees turns 40 again next year because uh, we had a great time and it, it really we worked out well and it was a, a great opportunity for us to kind of all show our appreciation to him and uh, yeah, it was a heck of a night. We uh, we we certainly enjoyed it and I know they jumped back into work the next day, but uh, we had a good time. So if the Saints had lost last week, Zach. Would the party have still gone on? Well, it would have, but I uh, would be lying if I didn't tell you that I was sitting in the booth uh, about midway through the second quarter going, this party's going to be a real dud. <laughs> You're going to walk in and get angry at everybody, and no one's going to show up. Uh, but worked out well, and, and it was a, a fitting ending to that day. <laughs> well, look, it all worked out for itself. But, look, thanks, Zach, so much, man. I appreciate it. Best of luck this weekend. Have a great call. We'll be listening. You and Deuce McAllister. Um, look, I can't wait for Sunday, man. Talk to you soon. Yeah, we can't, we can't either. And uh, thank you guys for having me. Have a great day. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.